um, analyzes how the educational system, particularly higher education, uh, shapes and forms our perceptions of race. Um, so, I mean, I think about my personal experiences going to a historically black college, um, going to grade school um, with majority white students. All of those things kind of shaped how I thought about myself and how I thought about others. And so I really want this documentary to analyze um, how it's shaping and forming the perceptions of kids today. You ready? Yep. Five, four, three, two, action. So in that leadership program that we did, uh, one of the graphs that they put up uh, was that in 2020, there will be more students of color than white students as far as the population of students will have to pull from to, to come to college. Do you find that students of color look for different things when coming to school, or, or is it pretty much the same across the board? When it comes to different types of students, whether they're multicultural students or, or your, your traditional Caucasian students, no. I think really the, the college student is looking for what the college student wants, and that's going to be an opportunity to have some fun, you know, do well in the classroom, have some of those college-type experiences. But for the most part, that list is going to be the same for every high school, college age. When student. I was doing my college uh, college visits and looking around, I did want to see some diversity because I feel like a lot of the times when there isn't any, it causes uh, problems within like talking about other races. Like if there's no diversity, they feel like okay, this is what race is here, so we're free to talk about who isn't here. I actually didn't think about diversity when I was selecting college, but now I wish I did. Because when I came, I didn't realize um, like how the there's not much Hispanics here. So since I didn't realize that, it was a very like big culture shock for me. When I was like looking at colleges, I was really concerned about you know feeling um, a, a particular way that I thought I was gonna you know be treated differently because um, I was a minority. So when I chose the school that I'm attending now, you know I looked at the the demographics, making sure that I was equally represented. Um, there was a talk between my mother and I that I needed to go to an HBCU. What do you think about um, HBCUs, like colleges that are specifically designed for students of color? In so many words, I would never go to a, a historical black college. The reason being, like I told you before, I'm, I'm, my mindset is very diverse. Um, me and Steven have been friends since freshman year. Um, I'm laughing, huh? <laughs> nah, bro. But, yeah. Personally, I don't think it makes much of a difference if there's historically black schools, majority white schools, because a big thing about it is the culture and the environment. I mean, some students may want to be, say an African-American student may want to be around all African-Americans, which that's okay with, and say a white student may want to be around mostly a majority white students. Mm -hmm. So I think it's mostly about the culture that the student wants to be a part of. I came to the HBCU because I had a pretty difficult experience in high school. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and my high school was in the outskirts of Memphis, and it was extraordinarily racist. That was my ideal decision, going to a black college, because I liked the black atmosphere. After growing up in white schools, I didn't really like, like it. I mean, I liked it, but I, I felt more comfortable, more playful being around uh, HBCU. So that was my ideal looking for colleges. But I ended up choosing Millersville, that here is a pretty white school. I was in HBCU because I wanted to uh, see my own people doing things. Um, when I was applying to colleges, race did come into my mind a little bit. I'm half African American and I grew up going to predominantly white schools. So I did want to go to a school where I could be exposed to just a little bit more of different people than just those same white people that I've always been exposed to. When I was picking colleges uh, my senior year of high school, um, diversity was definitely one of the things that I was looking um, for a college to have. Um, I came from a high school that was uh, predominantly white, so um, there was also, there was a, probably a handful of black kids. The racial makeup when I was choosing a university definitely was something I thought about. Um, I went to a school that had predominantly black kids for about 10 years, and then I went to a high school that was predominantly white in a very predominantly white town. To me, uh, race really wasn't a question uh, about going to a university. Um, to me, the real cause of going to a school is to get an education, to learn, uh, to learn things you never thought you could ever thought think of learning. And uh, growing up in a small town, you don't really think of race at all. 
since my town was mostly Hispanics, um, there was some whites and there were some African Americans, but not many. Many students are increasingly coming from racially homogenous neighborhoods and high schools, making it imperative for universities to use the classroom as a place where students can address their anxieties around race and confront the prejudices to which they may have become accustomed to. Which an education system builds a foundation for your life. So now that um, our education system is controlled, that means our whole lifetime, our whole life is controlled. In order to get beyond something, you have to understand it. And where in your education have you been required to learn about race? I mean, I, I tend to talk to my students about education being an institution. And so what you learn or don't learn about race or what you learn or don't learn about particular people, somebody literally sat at a table and made a decision about that. I'm not a history professor. I teach Africana studies. I want to teach about the diaspora, but I have to spend time teaching you history because nobody else did. Because we are totally... <sighs> unaware of our history. And I know that sounds like a cliche. So if we reflect on K through 12, we had to learn, we had to read the diary of Anne Frank. I did not read any narratives from enslaved Africans in K through 12. So you want me as a little black African girl to empathize with a little um, Jewish girl, more so than you want me to empathize with a little girl who perhaps looks like me. I mean, we're saying something about which bodies matter in which, you know, histories matter, in which trauma matters, and, and we carry that with us. I think we learn so much um, in the absence of our stories, you know, as much as we do in the present. In my college courses, I have learned uh, some about race. Uh, my one psychology class, uh, it had a video, and it was about race and, like, race, racial differences and things like that. And we actually had a discussion afterwards about the video. I did take a course um, in college about race, class, and gender in America, but I don't think that that really taught me anything about race. It was more just like a scratch the surface, what we already know. I don't think any of my college classes I've taken have taught me anything about race. With actual diversity on campus comes the responsibility of universities to make sure we are interrogating how our educational system forces students to think about race in unproductive and often very harmful ways, and how institutions are responsible for racism and racial segregation on their campuses. You know, I wonder about, it definitely encourages students to think about it. I just wonder how they're thinking about it. You know, so I'm thinking of the admissions process where you have to check a box, you know, identify yourself. And they give you a certain amount of options and um, they give you other. I don't think there's an advantage to checking off the box of ethnicity. Um, maybe some schools want you to think there is. But I don't, I just think um, they want to make pretend that they're diversifying it. Um... But however, like for me, I just I just check off the box because I'm not even going to say, you know, I'm not I'm going to put other just in case like I want to make them think. But I also think there's a lot of anxiety that it may produce for students who may be biracial or multiracial or even students who are of color because then it becomes this question, OK, I check this box. Is this going to impact my ability to get in? And then if I get in, is it because I am this box? Um, am I going to get something more if I check this box? When filling out forms, I have to check off one of those boxes about my race. I always put other. It wasn't even like a thought process anymore. It was just check other because I think growing up in predominantly white schools, people always look at me and they just say, she's black. And then it flip-flops when I talk to black people and they're like, you look white. So for me, it was always, you're not going to deny me my mother or my father. Are you ever strategic in what box you check off? When I'm doing applications, I'm never really strategic with which box that I check off. Sometimes it comes like hard, becomes hard to like figure out, okay, what do I put? Because it's kind of like a even split half and half. So it's like, what do I really do with this? Like saying that I'm just Caucasian is leaving out half of my history. Saying that I'm just black is leaving out half of my history. And because I appear white, if I do um, have to make that choice where there's like it's an online application and I have to choose one then I usually do choose Caucasian because I feel like if I choose uh, 
African American, then it'll become something like deceit. And it's like, I don't think so. You, you know, if I go into a room for that interview, it's like, well, no, you're not. So I always try to encourage administrators to start thinking outside of those boxes in terms of like, okay, we, we're asking these questions, we're asking students to check these boxes, but like, we're still not clear why. Because we want to say that, oh, we don't do quotas. We want to say that it really doesn't impact admissions, but it does. Look at the sort of Supreme Court cases where we're seeing this backlash against affirmative action, right? A lot of that is coming from how the admissions process forces us to think about race. Um, and, and there's a couple of ways that it, that it does this, right? It forces us to think about race as checking off a box. That's a severely limited way to think about racial or ethnic background. I understand that there are limitations of applications and you, and you have to do what you have to do, but that's a, that is a um, awfully categorical way to force people to think about race. It limits our sense of what the nuances of race are. Uh, it limits our sense of, of how miscegenated cultures actually operated, uh, uh, operate. It limits our sense and our understanding of, um, of how racial identity works in our world and in our society. Uh, it prevents us from understanding the socially constructed nature of race. And so checking the box has a lot of limitations for how we can think about race. Affirmative action serves as a checks and balances, balances for me. So as long as we have a disproportionate number of African Americans in the workplace, in college, in sectors of the country that we would deem to be successful sectors. As long as we have a disproportionate number of African Americans in the middle class, then we need some type of checks and balance system, whether it be affirmative action, whatever we want to call it. I don't think they should consider race when uh, accepting people for jobs or um, universities. In theory, it sounds like a nice idea. However, I think that that then starts to put a new stigma on things where we're already trying to fix others. So now it's on top of everything else we try to we try to deal with in the world, now it's, I might not get this job because of the color of my skin. And I think that puts us backwards instead of having us propel frontward because it's going back to the, what do I check on this box? Am I going to be accepted? And then it also adds issues, even between like your own friend circles of you're both competing for the same job. And instead of coming down to who's more qualified, it might come down to, well, we have six blacks and five whites, we need to even it out, so I'm gonna give it to the white person, or vice versa. I don't think that universities should, should uh, <clears throat> consider race, because I feel like, like I said, that's the color of your skin. And if I, like I said, if I put a on an application that I'm black and I walk into a room, then it's like, wait a minute, no you're not. So then I don't think that Putting that on an application should matter whether or not you get accepted, whether or not you get aid. I also think that it's kind of like sad almost that they're like, okay, well, I need to make the quota for how many African-American students, how many Asian students. I feel like that's something that really shouldn't exist. One of the common misconceptions when talking about race-based affirmative action is the use of quotas. However, in 1978, the Regents of California versus Baki case made the use of racial quotas in college admissions unconstitutional when Alan Baki, a white student, sued after twice being denied admission to medical school. I don't think it is fair for universities to uh, take a moment and observe the person's race because I feel it, it makes some sort of bias uh, in a way that they have to accommodate the um, arriving students to make sure they have that special amount of uh, token students into their class. Because if they're putting the students in there just because that they are a different race, then I don't think that they're doing their job. I believe there's more opportunities for minorities to get um, fundings or scholarships. There's more scholarship opportunities in general. I mean, like, for example, the Gates Millennium, it pretty much just is for everyone except for white people. And it's like, oh. That'd be great. <laughs> do you think that's discriminatory at all? Or do you think, you know, we need those scholarships for her? As a black person, no, I don't. But I would understand how a white person would feel if I was in their shoes. But right now, no, because I feel as though we don't get a lot of stuff handed down to us. Like, it's easier, not, not saying it's easier for them, because white people do work hard just as 
my other minority, but most of the time, it's not like that. Minority students are dealing with the stigma of affirmative action in which their qualifications and merit are in question. Minority students also face the prevailing misconception that they are the beneficiaries of financial assistance primarily because of the color of their skin. This stigma follows students through undergraduate, graduate school, and into the workplace. If your biggest concern is that you missed out on a scholarship to go to college when most of my people don't even have the opportunity to receive a basic elementary education, I think you've just proven how elitist you really are. You've just shown your privilege. And from that point forward, what, what more should we discuss? So I, I was taking my um, uh, exam for on a, a Southern American lit course, and um, I had a little cubicle. Grad students had these little cubicles. And right before I was coming in, I came in to like get my notes and get ready to go take this exam, and someone had like inscribed nigger on the desk. Right now, <clears throat> mind you, I, this is year five or six for me in North Carolina. So it's no stranger to like how race operates in a different way in the South than maybe it does uh, uh, in, in, in the North. But but and it's not the first time I heard the N word, not the first time anyone has said anything racially to me, not the first time that I felt discriminated against. But the idea that someone would take the time and like scratch it out in my desk just disturbed me more than than many of the other encounters that I've had with race. But, you know, I went in, I, t I aced that exam, though. And I can remember, I remember in the exam, I wrote about that fact in the exam, too, just to, you know, it, that moment taught me a lot about how you, how you work through some of those issues. Don't think that people my age don't like to talk about race, because um, I think that if you put them with the right group of people, they're okay with it. Uh, I also feel like, though, sometimes that can be turned into the wrong type of things, like uh, the discussion that I just talked about for my psychology course. It was a group of pro uh, prominently white uh, <clears throat> girls that was in that discussion, and they were talking down about the African-American race, and they just kept talking it down and talking it down. And, like, I took so much, and then I was like, actually, I'm half black. So you're kind of like dissing my race right now. Just because I don't appear as that doesn't mean that it's not a part of my history, not a part of who I am. So I felt really offended by that. And I feel like it depends on who's watching when they're talking about race. Because I feel like if I were to go in there and I had a darker skin tone, that same conversation would not have went the way that it did. I have um, witnessed racially, you know, uh, you know, prejudice, prejudice uh, comments and things like that. I also think it wasn't on purpose, but they it's like out of ignorance. And I don't, you know, get completely upset because I know that that's what they assume. They see things through media. And honestly, sometimes people throw out comments just to see what you will react. Like, are you going to get mad? Or, you know, is this the thing that I say around black people? So they don't necessarily know that, the, that it's offensive. I think it is up to us to inform them in a, you know, correct way that, you know, that's not the way that you go about things. But I have experienced and it's taught me and grown me to like, you know, understand that everybody doesn't see you the same. Definitely have experienced or and seen um, some racially charged situations on campus, especially in classrooms. Um, the classroom discussions have always gotten very charged and very heated, and it seems as though professors are very wary of stepping in and trying to mitigate through those circumstances. On campus, when it comes to like administrators and professors, I think they're very cautious about the things they say. But when it comes to students and like open discussions in classrooms where, you know, it's appropriate to speak on your opinions. I have had instances where I wouldn't say they were like insensitive to the ideas, but they just didn't realize that what they were saying could have been kind of offensive. I have not ever heard of any racially, um, how did you word it? Insensitive, insensitive uh, comments or anything like that. It hasn't happened to me personally. Um, however, I did organize a blackout on campus about um, a couple of weeks ago, and actually I heard from an administrator who felt that we were leaving people out, a particular group out, and I thought, wow, and they mentioned conservatives, and I was really unclear, like, what does that really mean? Um, and actually it wasn't until afterwards that I heard on social media, on Yik Yak particularly, that people had a lot of comments 
um, that were racially insensitive that I had not heard because I don't have that form of social media. I do not think that there are less occurrences of those kinds of microaggressive behaviors with respect to race. And the only reason why I can say that without giving you any quantifiable data is social media. Uh, social media has opened up the floodgates. And actually, uh, the ACLU has done some really interesting studies, as so has the Southern uh, Property Law Center, have done some really interesting studies on the rise of racism on the internet and social media in the Obama era. Racism and racial hostility on college campuses is deeply intertwined with anonymity in ways that historically have not been possible. Social media apps such as Yik Yak allow for an extension of race-based death threats, racial slurs, and racism whilst concealing one's identity. So while yelling out racist slurs or writing racist epithets on someone's desk may seem more egregious than an anonymous post on a messaging or video app, consider social media as a platform that allows for the same type of racial discrimination with the same social impact. What was happening back in the day is no different than what's happening now. I feel like back home in California, um, I, I had those stereotypes, the same stereotypical things that people think of us, I thought of us as well, until I came out here and saw that there's more to life than what I knew. Um, I would ha you have to be exposed sometime. Um, undergrad is such a critical time, and these four years you need to be in a place where you can be molded and cultivated. You need to be around people who want to instill um, vision in you, who want, to, who want to pull out that greatness and not suppress it. And so I knew I had to be in this space. Your campus climate is a climate that actually is inviting for people from different backgrounds. Um, but having mentors of color or mentors who understand and connect with students who have a certain set of experiences, either that's, that could be first generation students, um, that could be women, uh, that could be Latino students, uh, international students. Having mentors who understand some of the challenges those students are going to have um, is absolutely vital. And listen, we don't want to leave our white male counterparts out, but we just have to understand that at institutions of higher learning, they have models and mentors all over the place, in faculty, in administration, in staff, you know, and, and in their fraternities, you know what I mean, through alumni affiliations, and they're making great use. Think of this, because sometimes people feel like, well, man, they're always talking about all these extra things that these people of color need. You know, you take your typical white male student who's in a fraternity, uh, who has a pretty good relationship with their faculty person. Some of that is because of the race and gender of the folks. They have things in common. Um, now, because it's unmarked doesn't mean that we should ignore it. Uh, we should understand that that's part of how those students navigate the college experience successfully. That's part of how they get jobs when they get out. Um, and so why not? Why wouldn't we afford our all of our students those opportunities if we could? Can you describe the racial makeup of departments that you have been a part of or that you are currently a part of? White. You're, you're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, predominantly white. So the racial makeup of the academic departments that I have been a part of has been predominantly white. So uh, in graduate school, it's a predominantly white uh, uh, department at the graduate level and faculty level. But I do um, find that having a predominantly white staff and white administrators, white professors, it directly impacts a lot of students on campus and a lot of students' experiences. Um, when we try to do some things on campus where it has a racial background or even with everything that happened just in Mizzou, there was not a lot of support from professors. Um, and I think in part a lot of that has to do with, again, people feeling out of place due to their own race and not wanting to step on something they feel as though is not their own. Um, but then also I find it that a lot of students have come to me saying that a white teacher teaching something of a a racial or cultural background seems to interfere with how they take the messages from the classes. I do think that not having faculty members that look like you at a university might, might be a problem because <clears throat> a lot of people, even at this age, you still look up to the people that are your, your se senior to you. So if you see all college professors that are white and you're black and you think, well, I would like to be a professor, but I mean, look around me, they're all white, can I really do that? So it kind of like hinders on your goals and aspirations because you think about what you see and you don't see things like you. 
So I think that that does play a role. It's a little disheartening to see, you know, the lack of black professors on campus um, because you want to have someone to look up to and you want to have a mentor who really understands you, who understands your struggles, where you've come from, who can connect with you on like a totally different level than, you know, a white male advisor would. I think it would be great to have um, Hispanic faculty members because I haven't had one and I'm going to go right in my senior year and I probably won't have one. So I haven't even had an African-American professor. I know there is here, but I haven't had one. So all of them have been white. Why aren't faculty numbers increasing? And that's the thing that kind of like, you know, gets under my skin. I think the presumption, again, is that we aren't good enough to get in those spaces. I've been at, I was at one institution where in one year, I watched three female faculty of color be denied tenure and nobody having a critical conversation about why. The presumption is just that they didn't earn it, right? That they're not as good as their white or Asian counterparts. But it's like, well, let's look at their experiences at this space. Subconsciously, I feel that we may think that maybe we're not good enough to become the professors. However, I'd had the opportunity to know that we have to diversify like higher ed. Um, we've been recruiting students of color into our graduate program, so we have a few students of color in the graduate program as well. You know, what, what has to happen to really make departments, programs, institutions more diverse is you've got to find out what the critical mass threshold is and try to achieve that. Um, and critical mass is not always exclusive to race. Sometimes it's about having gender diversity, uh, a diversity of different identities to help the communities cohere around diversity. And you reach that critical mass is how you retain the folks. Because in all these departments and programs we're talking about, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's melt. There are people who they come in and they leave. They don't stay. They don't, you know, we're not retaining. It's not just about recruiting. It's about how do you retain. Um, and that's, that, that's really what becomes the challenge when you talk about faculty for sure. But I'll small town you don't really think of race at all. I feel like back home in California um, I, I had those stereotypes, the same stereotypical things that people think of us I thought of us as well until I came out here and saw that there's more to life than what I knew. Like every person that drops out of school they, they build a new jail cell. Mm -hmm. that, that impacts me so much.